so I want to uh, I want to uh, get to that. So again, roughly at the same time that I was here last time, two and a half years ago, or actually three or four years ago already, um, I was meeting with the dean of engineering, and we were discussing the teaching of introductory physics to engineers. Now, the way it's typically done <laughs> is that it's the physics department teaching introductory physics to engineering students. And in the physics department, what happens is that they take a course that is normally taught to physicists and then water it down for engineers. But, you know, the needs of engineers are very different from the needs of physicists. So we had this discussion, and she suggested to me that it would be good if we would rethink the teaching of physics to the engineering students. And, um, and I said, yeah, I agree, it'd be a lot of fun. And she asked me, would you be willing to do it? I said, I'm definitely interested in doing this, but it's going to take time. And uh, she ended up giving me a year off from teaching and um, giving me the opportunity to invest the time I would normally invest in teaching in redesigning a course. And that was an eye-opening uh, experience, to be able to reflect on what I'd done in the past, to be able to educate myself. I visited other classrooms at MIT, at Olin College, I went to McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada, I went to Melbourne University in Australia to look at their active implementation of active learning, I went to Delft University, I, I just visited different places, observed classes, and it's so illuminating to sit in the back of, of an, another person's class and see from a perspective that's very different from your own perspective as a teacher in front of the class, what it feels like to be in a different environment. I also read a lot. And one book that had a tremendous impact on my thinking is this book by a friend of mine, Alan November. He's a consultant for K-12 education and wrote this beautiful book with the title, Who Owns the Learning? In the introduction for this book, the preface, he described something that ha happened to him early in his career. And it's the most important part of the book, so I'll tell you, you, you won't have to buy the book and read it. In the early 80s, which was the beginning of the PC revolution, Apple had just come out with the Macintosh, IBM with the PC, he was a high school teacher of history at Lexington High School, which is west of Boston. It's an affluent suburb. A lot of Harvard professors live in Lexington. And it's one of the best public schools in the United States. And because it's in an affluent suburb, it was actually one of the first high schools in the US to have a computer classroom. And even though he was not a computer scientist or a mathematician or anything, the superintendent had appointed him to be in charge of the computer classroom. And during the first year, on a Sunday morning, he gets a phone call from the school that there had been a break-in in the computer classroom. Would he please come to school to punish the student who had broken in? He lives about 30 kilometers away, and Sunday being a holiday in the US, he wasn't very happy about having to drive from his home in Marblehead to Lexington. But he got into his car, drove to the school, parked his car in the parking lot, and noticed that none of the windows of the computer classroom were broken. He went inside the school. The door to the computer classroom had not been forced open. He opened the door, looked inside. All of the computers were there. There was just one strange thing. There was a student sitting at one of the computers. So he went over to the student and said, Gary, what are you doing here? And Gary looked up at him and said, I want to learn how to program the computer. And at that moment, he realized that if somebody wants to learn, they'll do anything. And rather than punishing Gary, he should really be rewarding Gary for having brought In fact, what he did, he told Gary to take the computer home and you know, learn the programming at home. I find that a very powerful anecdote. Because think about it. If anything, well, think about this. You know, it takes small children, four, five, six-year-old, right? 
in a sense, we're all born scientists, whether we end up in science or not. We're all born scientists. We keep pestering our parents, our teachers with the question, why, why, why? Our, our brains are wired to wanting to understand the world around us. Not because somebody gives us exams and lectures and punishes us. No, because we want that intrinsically. If anything, education does a really good job turning this intrinsic desire to learn off. <laughs> and by the time we get the students in our classrooms, it's no longer about the why, 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 and I want to understand, I want to know. No. Tell me how to pass the test. Mm -hmm. So the rest of the book tells you know, how to so reinstitute that intrinsic desire to learn. Actually, better would be to keep it on all the time and, and not turn it off. So I thought about it and I thought, boy, wouldn't it be nice if my students, engineering students and pre-medical students who don't want to learn physics, you know, actually have that innate desire to learn, if, it, if I find a way to reawaken this intrinsic desire to learn. But how do you do that with physics? It became clear quite soon that I had to come up with some kind of Trojan horse <laughs> and, and, and hide the physics inside that Trojan horse. So my Trojan horse, after a lot of reading, took on two forms, the form of project-based learning and team-based learning. The project, in a sense, is to, and I'll say more about that in a second, is to get this intrinsic desire. So rather than telling my students, here's my book, learn it, it's good for you, I tell my students, we're going to work on this really exciting project, and I'll say how I designed the project in a second. And when they're really enthusiastic about the project, I tell them, here, you may want to have a look at this book. It could help you with your project. So the content of the course, rather than being a goal in its own right, becomes a vehicle to accomplish a goal that's more meaningful in the minds of the students. The second is a team-based approach. I mean, I hear from employers who visit our School of Engineering all the time that you know, we're not preparing our students for the workplace. And think about it. What are the biggest problems that, 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 that occur in academia, in industries? People are not being able to work together. But think about it. We never train people to work together. They're coming to class, sitting alone in class. Well, they're sitting with others in class, but I said earlier, you're not really interacting in class. And then they're being examined individually, separately, cut off from each other. So we do very little to give an opportunity to develop collaborative skills. The team-based learning also is, in a sense, to bring a social responsibility to the learning. Let's say that the four of us are on a team, and I always come 10 minutes late to class, and I have not done my preparation for class. They have done it, but I have not. The project is so hard that we all need to contribute. None of us would be able to do it alone. They're going to be upset at me because I come 10 minutes late and I haven't done my part. I will get social pressure. I will think, oh, I better do my work because my friends are going to be upset, which is actually a much stronger pressure than Professor Mazur being upset at me coming 10 minutes late. In fact, Professor Mazur doesn't care about me coming 10 minutes late anymore. Social pressure. Intrinsic motivation. So what this also did, this year off, it gave me an opportunity to think about the output before I thought about the input. I, I think I may have showed this book two and a half years ago, Understanding by Design, which basically says that to design a good curriculum, rather than thinking about content first and then how you're going to teach and how you're going to assess it, it would be much better to start at the output end. What do I want to accomplish? And then work backwards. And I had already tried to do that within the context of an existing course. It is very difficult because you're already inheriting all of this baggage. It's much better to start with a completely clean slate wipe everything you've done off the table and think, OK, I'm going to design a course. What are the desired outcomes? What do I want my students to accomplish? And then what am I going to use as evidence that I've actually 
accomplish that. And if I can't think of any evidence, I probably not formulate my outcome very effectively. So it's an iterative process. And then the last thing is, what am I going to do in the class in order to maximize the output? Now, of course, you can do this alone, but it would be much better if you did this within the context of your department or your university education. So I actually involved my colleagues. I sent out a questionnaire to about 60 colleagues. Anybody who taught a course that required physics as a prerequisite, I sent them that questionnaire. And I asked them, you know, what do you want your students to be able to do after taking my course and before taking your course? About half of them responded, and half of those who responded had never thought about learning outcomes. They all say, it came basically with a list of topics. I want them to know mechanics, I want them to know kinematics, and so on, which was really not what I wanted to know. But about half of them actually thought more about the actions. I would like my, able, my students to be able to solve this or that type of problem. And, and, and that was actually useful. So I came up with three lists. One absolutely upper level list where you know, there are competencies like qualitative analysis, quantitative analysis, diagnosis, and so on. Um, and then a set of course goals, self-directed learning, because these competencies are, are completely discipline independent. They could as well be for a statistics course or a civil engineering course or anything. Content mastery, teamwork, and professionalism. And, uh, and then a list of content specific goals, which is about six pages long, you know, about you know, how to apply the content that, that, that would be in this course. I'm not going to show this to you because it's not of interest unless you're a physicist. Uh, but if you're really curious, you can go to uh, this URL, AP50, which is the, the, num the name of the course, visitor at this bit.ly. Uh, and my slides can be downloaded, so you, you will have access to them uh, uh, later on uh, if you want. And then you can see the syllabus and, 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 and all of this in much more detail. The second thing was the environment. I, the work that I talked about two and a half years ago was all done in this type of environment, which I'm sure many classrooms on campus here are also like this, like, like this one here right now. You only have to look at this and you can right away see that it's focused on information transfer and it's centered on the faculty. That's the center of attention and in a sense the most important person in the room. Whereas actually it's the students who are the most important in the room. So I thought this is not the right environment to teach a course and to actually give ownership of learning back to my students. Here, the learning is owned by the teacher, not by the students. So I went around, I looked at the Teal classroom at MIT, the Technology Enhanced Active Learning. I, I looked at lots of different learning spaces and it turned out that above my office there was a library. I'd last set foot in that library 10 years ago. I don't know about you, how often you go to the library, but if I, I get upset if I can't get an electronic copy of a journal or, or, or a book. So I had not visited that library in 10 years and I was curious as to my colleagues whether they had gone to the library. It turned out nobody I asked had ever gone to this library. So I, I asked what the budget for the library was and how many books got checked out and when I took the ratio of those two it turned out that every book that was checked out cost $200. Can you imagine that? That means you could as well give everybody who wants to check out a book $200 to buy that book and other books. Right. So I argued that we convert that library to a classroom. I didn't succeed fully. It turns out the librarians at Harvard are unionized. So, <laughs> <coughs> so the best we could do is squeeze them in half the space and use half the space. But it was beautiful space. It was under the roof with skylights, windows all around except for one wall. But that was a problem too because that meant we couldn't put any boards. It was beautiful space, which is good because I want students to want to come to that space. But there was no white board space. So we asked architectures for ideas and we decided to incorporate technology and this and that and the other and the bill went up, 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 up. And at some point we said, wait a minute, we don't know how students are using technology. Let's scrap all of those plans. We're going to do it as cheaply as possible. And the end result was this. This is a picture of that room. So instead of putting whiteboards or snap glass or technology, we had students bring in their own technology. 
And then we put these mobile whiteboards. I, I've for this picture, I've taken some of the whiteboards away, otherwise you just see whiteboards. Right? But the whiteboards are everywhere, which is great. Because even if you would like to lecture, you cannot <laughs> lecture, right? I mean, not only do half the students have their back to you, 80% are hidden by a whiteboard. And, you know, when they work on projects and they want to sort of keep their projects you know, secret from other teams, they can put these whiteboards around and it becomes a cubicle. Look at this classroom. It's, inter it's completely focused on interaction and it's completely centered on the students. If I tell my students, can I have your attention please? Can I have your attention please? They're not even paying attention to me. It's very frustrating. Initially, it was very, fr I've learned to appreciate that as a sign of something good happening, but initially it was very frustrating. I can no longer get the room under control. No lectures for reasons that I've already mentioned, and no exams for reasons that I mentioned here two and a half years ago. Because the exam, again, robs the student of ownership. That doesn't mean there's no assessment, there's continuous assessment along multiple dimensions, the dimensions of the learning outcomes. And there's continuous feedback to the student, but no high stakes exams. I already talked about this, um, so I'm going to briefly talk about, it. no, I'm not going to talk about information transfer because I already did this, I'm going to jump straight to the projects and then talk about the in-class activity. So for the information transfer, I already told you that, perusal. Let's now talk about the Trojan Horde, the projects. I actually learned a lot about how to design effective projects from the business school at Harvard. By the way, um, do you have a business school here at Technion? Anybody from the business school here? Do you use a case study method here? Uh, so to so, some extent. To some yeah, extent. Yeah. If you have a chance to watch, uh, I, I learned so much from watching a good case study course and, and participate in that course. That's one of the things I did during that year I had off. I went to observe some case study, which at Harvard is ingrained in the DNA of the, of the school. In fact, I would not be surprised if you use some of the Harvard cases in, uh, in the courses here at the Technion, because Harvard actually makes money selling its cases to other, uh, other business schools. So anyway, I'll get to that, back to that in just a second. I thought, for a long time I thought, is there a way I can have one project for the whole course? It's a two semester course and I couldn't think of one project that would in a meaningful way embed all of the different parts of the content of the curriculum. So I ended up with month long projects. Each semester is three months. So that means that in the fall there are three projects and in the spring there are three other projects. Every student works on the same project during a given month. And of course, the way, they, the way they materialize that project can be very different, but this, the, the context is the same for all groups of students. Also, rather than having a team formation for the entire course, I make a new team formation for every single uh, project. So if the four of us work on project one, we're guaranteed not to work together on project two, project three, project four, and so on. Why? Because, <laughs> I anticipated your question there, <laughs> because my ability to form effective teams is limited. I may make a mistake and put four people together who just end up not being able to work very well, and I don't want that lack of ability to form good teams to color students' experience. It's highly unlikely that I put a student six times in teams that don't work well together. But more importantly, I want the students to learn. So at the end of each project, I put them in the prisoner's dilemma and they have to give feedback on each other. And the feedback gets anonymized and then presented back to the students. Let's say I come back late, I come to class late, 10 minutes every time and not well prepared, they're going to be unhappy in the anonymous evaluation and they will say, Eric, you should come on time, you should do your work. Right? And because I get negative feedback, which will eventually translate into the grade, I have an opportunity when I get into the new team to start with a fresh slate and you know, come on time and do my work and try to do better on the team working part of the, of the course. 
So this is what I learned from the business school. The rules that the business school has for the design of cases is that, and I just changed the word case to project. To be successful, the project or the case, in the case of the business school, must require the practical application of skills. Let's say you teach a course on finance. What do you want your students to be able to do? Well, you may want them to be able to determine the market capitalization of a, of a company. Or you may be able to have them determine what a reasonable stock price is at an initial public offering. Right? Those are the type of skills that you know, people trained in finance should be able to, to, uh, to gain. That translates easily to physics in an engineering context. Right? I want my students to be able to apply the laws of mechanics and designing, blah, 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 and so on. So that was easy. The second part is, to be successful, the project or the case must be linked to real world problems. How does the business school do that at Harvard? They look at the uh, Wall Street Journal, they take real companies with real cases, but then they change the name of the company so the students can't Google what the market capitalization is and so on. Right? So they take actually real things. And that's a little bit harder in physics. I mean, ask any physicist and he or she will tell you physics is the science of the real world. But step into a physics lab and you see all kinds of things that you and I don't have in our kitchen. And you know, I think most students in engineering or in pre-meds who go into a physics lab are not really seeing the connection between what they do there and the real world. We've invested a lot of money in equipment that goes in these teaching labs. I decided to eliminate it all. I mean, look, there's physics all around us. My voice reaching your ears, the, the wind blowing through the trees outside. I mean, there's physics everywhere. Let's use the real world as our lab. And most students nowadays have these devices. They're fantastic devices. They have sensors. They have cameras that can take video at 240 frames a second. So let's have them use their devices to take measurements about events in the real world. And let's use the real world as the context, as the lab. I had to open my mind to do that. But it's been, it's been fantastically rewarding. The last rule from the business school was the case has to have a compelling narrative. It has to have a component of empathy or social good. Yes, the business school at Harvard. I'm, I'm not joking. <laughs> okay. So each case will start by addressing the student. You have been appointed by a family to invest in inheritance. You're helping the family. But now in order to invest the inheritance, you need to know, you know where to invest it. And are you going to invest it in a, in a company that is just starting you know, out and that has an initial public offering? And you, but you need to know how safe that is. You need to know about the company. Very clever. I thought about it and said, God, that would be beautiful, wouldn't it? But that turned out to be the hardest part, <coughs> to actually think of a compelling narrative that puts the students in a position to do some good, either social good or helping others. So I have uh, six projects. These are the names. I, 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 I'm not going to go into details because I'm not talking about physics here. But I want to briefly talk about how I accomplished this empathy social good for one of the projects in the context of a project that I called Symphosium, which has to do with waves, oscillation, and sound, that part of the curriculum which normally is not a very exciting part of the curriculum for, uh, for these students. So at the beginning of uh, the um, project, the students get a brief, which is lying on the tables, which is about 15 pages, which explains the context. And it also explains all of the requirements for the projects and, and you know, where they find resources and, and, and so on. It's basically like a little book. And in that, that visitor packet, that I, I showed to you with bit.ly.ap50 visitor, you can find one example of a brief. So for sound, for, for, for this part, for the symposium, the context is El Sistema. How many of you have heard of El Sistema? One person. Okay. El Sistema started in the 60s in Venezuela with an economist by the name of José Abreu. 
who realized that poverty in the poor neighborhoods in Caracas was sort of a self-perpetuating cycle. You know, kids would go to school, they would come out of school at 2 o'clock, uh, back home, nothing to do at home, mother is trying to make ends meet, father who has joined a gang a long time ago is in prison, and you know by age 14 they've joined the gang themselves. And, and in many you know, poor neighborhoods around the world that, that poverty sort of self-perpetuated itself. He was a, a classical musician, amateur musician, and he decided to use music to do social good. And back in the mid-60s, he started with about you know, 20 students playing as a garage. Now in Venezuela and many other countries, I don't know if Israel has an El Sistema, but I know that the Netherlands, India, the US have. Um, what happens is that students after school join a youth orchestra where rather than playing in the street, they focus on making music with each other. So I, I tell the students about that and I show them a little clip from one of the many documentaries that have been made about El Sistema. My third night of being in Venezuela, we heard a concert of Gustavo Dudamel conducting the Teresa Carreño Youth Orchestra. I literally have the hair stand up on the back of my neck. By the way, Gustavo Dudamel is actually a product of El Sistema. He could have been in prison or a gang member had he not been a part. Now he's the conductor of Los Angeles Philharmonic, and I'm sure he visits Israel repeatedly to, to direct the Israeli Philharmonic or other big orchestras. He is a product of El Sistema. And there are famous musicians all over the world who are uh, products of El Sistema. I showed them a little bit more. In particular, I showed them what happens in the early grades. In Venezuela, which right now is pretty much of a mess, there's just not enough money to buy instruments for all of the kids. So in grades one through four, rather than making instruments available, students design instruments from cardboard that don't make music. They're mute. And then the instructor you know, has a big boom box that, that plays Beethoven's Third Symphony, and the students just pretend to play. At least they, they learn how to use, to hold their violin and, and how to keep the rhythm. I cut there, and I tell my students, your task is to design a beautifully musical instrument for El Sistema out of just recycled parts. And of course, then the physics comes in. They'll have to determine what the musical range. They'll have to use their physics knowledge to increase the musical range. They have to determine the Q factor. They have no idea what the Q factor is, but they'll have to figure it out one way or another and how that improves you know, the instrument. They have to determine the harmonic spectrum. What does the harmonic spectrum depend on? Is it temperature dependent? Will it hold up while they're playing the instrument? Uh, sound level, tuning stability, and so on. So those are some of the requirements for the design of their instruments. So I need no more than about eight minutes, a little bit more than I did with you, and they're hooked. You know, they, they'll come to me and say, if we design a good instrument, can we actually get it to El Sistema? Now it turns out that near Harvard there's a music school called the Longy School of Music, where one of the professors is a world-renowned oboist, um, and he is, has a physics undergraduate from Harvard couldn't be more perfect. So he's one of the judges who actually judges the instruments and, and is able to actually ask questions about physics to the students as well. Um, so, you know, what are the milestones? Well, after sh telling them about the project like I just, the teams have to develop a team contract. This I did only after the third iteration of the class because what did I notice? You see, on the first day of a project, we'll be at the door and as the people come in, we have a list and it says, uh, you're at table two, you know, you're at table three. We formed the teams. We noticed that students would just sit down at the table, grab their laptop and start, you know, doing email. <laughs> rather than saying, hi, I'm John, I'm in your team, you know, worry, what, are, what are you, you know, trying to learn some, no, they, would, they wouldn't even talk to their team members, right? They only have one month to design an instrument and they would not talk to each other. So now we have them immediately work on a team contract. Team contract, they have to give themselves a name, 
they have to give the team a name, a social, you know, uh, uh, personality, if you want. Then they have to say what the mission of their team is. And then they have to say how they're going to work together and how they're going to resolve difficulties. If you look at the team contracts early on, the first ones, they're very poorly written. If they have difficulties, they'll come and talk to the professor, me. Well, then a difficulty happens, right? And three students will come to me and say, um, we haven't seen Sarah in the last two weeks. And they want me to do something about it, right? I said, oh, that's, that's terrible. I said, um, yeah, yeah. It, it, maybe something happened to her. I said, did you call her? <laughs> no, no, we didn't, we didn't call her. I said, I, should, I would call her if I were So they very quickly discovered that I don't solve problems for them. They have to solve it, right? And they have to work out how they're going to, you know, account for credit and so on among themselves. It's not my business, right? Same thing. This is the way how society works, right? I mean, you have to learn how to work together. And we do such a poor job as, uh, as uh, instructors in, in higher ed doing that. So that's at the beginning. After about a week or sometimes two weeks, they have to submit a proposal. The proposal is just a one page thing, how they're, what they're going to build, what type of instrument, how they're going to build it, and so on. The reason we have them do that because some of them get so, their their imagination gets unleashed to the point of being unrealistic, right? And and they put expectations for themselves that are way too high. So this is a way for us to keep them realistic and to make sure that they don't fall into a trap that we know can happen and that will make the project not very successful. Then we have the fair, which is the project fair, which we make a public event. So we don't do it in the classroom. We do it in a place where, you know, like the science center near the, the, the dining area so that other students go by there and say, wow, what is, what is happening here, you know? And, and we have a sign of the course. So that has made the course very popular, let me tell you. <laughs> we, we, now have to, we're, we have to be very selective in who we admit to uh, the course. Then they have to submit a report. Initially, we just said report, and what we found is that paper students do not know how to write. They do not, you know, Harvard students do not know how to write. They'll take everything they've done during the month, staple it together, and hand it in. So now, they have to write it like a scientific publication. We give them, you know, the, the, we give them the, the, the constraints of an of a engineering journal publication, and they have to adhere to the same lengths and, and, and other requirements. And just as like for a real paper, we don't have them just hand in the paper and then say this is, you know, a good paper or a poor paper and so on. No, we have to hand it and then we give them feedback, we give them a review. Now you may think, is that a lot of work? Well, there's one paper per team. So in a class of 60 that mean, and, and teams of let's say four or five, that means you end up with about um, 15 or, or, or 12 uh, report. So it's actually not as much grading work as it used to be before. And then, and then af after everything has been handed in, and by that time the students are already working with a new team, we ask them to do this peer self and team assessment, and we cross-correlate their assessment. Right? So I can tell you more about that. I, I don't think I have time to do that now, but maybe I'll come back next year and I'll give you a full <laughs> the full picture of, uh, of, of this whole course. I put them in a prisoner's dilemma so they have no choice but to be honest about each other and themselves. Here's a video that they generated, one of the teams. to designing a robust, creative, and economical flute for El Sistema. Our flute is 100% recycled with the wooden dowel, the duct tape, the plastic, and the PVC all from the engineering lab, so our cost is zero. Our design is a modular tripartite design in which we combine three flutes in one. As thus, we can interchange the different flutes for different notes and different scales.
So they all have to make this three minute video and I cut out the part about how they use their physics knowledge to improve the instrument because, you know, it'd be harder to interpret. And also I didn't want to make this too long, but you sort of see also how their imagination gets carried away. And Now, another interesting side note is that for the team formation here, I need to survey their musical abilities. So I ask them whether they can read music, whether they can play an instrument, and I make sure I distribute that ability among the teams. Otherwise, a team would be handicapped. So it's sort of interesting to see how some of the skills, you bring in skills from outside the discipline, which I actually think is a good thing. You know, because This partitioning in, in different disciplines is sort of very um, arbitrary. Okay. So I, I really hit it well here with this empathy or social good. I, I haven't always been able. How many of you are familiar with the, the sort of electromagnetic safe competition that's held at the Weizmann every year? Yeah, okay, a few people. So one of our projects is they have to build an, a safe that is locked by electromagnetic. You see the pictures here. So that we turn into a competition. In other words, rather than having social good, we make the competition. However, one of the things we learned very quickly is that you have to be very careful when you add a competition. You have to be sure that the competition is not part of the evaluation. Because as soon as you make the competition part of the evaluation, they'll use their elbows and it becomes vicious. Also, if there's a failure, let's say a team becomes very uh, ambitious and, and, and takes risk and then on the day of the fair a crucial part breaks and it doesn't work, you know, it's terrible, right? So it, you don't want that to factor into the evaluation. So the competition is just a competition. Somebody wins but they don't win anything and it's not going to affect the grade. It's the oral examination that takes place between the judges and, and, and the teams that really determine, you know, uh, uh, that's really an assessment of their, of, their, of their knowledge. You see them here happy, they cracked open this uh, safe as you can see. So we used to have lectures and then discussion sections and then labs for a total of about six hours per week. I decided to eliminate all of that. No lectures, no discussion section, no lab. We would have just one thing, class. And instead of meeting a few hours here, a few hours there, we're going to meet twice a week for three hours. It's long, yes, but we'll do different activities. We essentially use a blend of six scaffolded best practices. Two are dealing with the understand level. Uh, we have learning catalytics, which is the closest to what was left over from my old course, peer instruction, a tutorial that they solve in groups. Um, and then we have two activities that deal, this is a 90 minutes, this is 60 minutes, this is 30 minutes, that deal with applying their knowledge, taking what they've learned and apply it to a new context, estimation activities and experimental design activities. And then we have two which have to do with evaluation. Most of it reflective, reflection and, um, and uh, um, uh, you know, feedback to the student rather than just the instructor. And then we essentially scaffold that. So each of these blocks is one project. This is three hours. These are the dates. And you can see that if you look at one project, about two thirds are guided scaffolded activities and one third is unguided. They use that time essentially to uh, work on their project. And, but we're there to help them and we know that they have that time available because that's the time that they set aside for class. Here's the team contract, and then the proposal is either one or two weeks into the course, depending on how much content knowledge they need to have. And then the fair is at the end of the, of the uh, event. I have no time, unfortunately, to discuss the in-class activities. Um, I wanted to briefly discuss the problem set, but I'm going to skip that because um, I, I'm running late. I want to get to the... Uh, I'm very proud of the, 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 the approach to homework. We, we, we actually defeated cheating, which was rampant with homework, with students copying each other's homework, and focused it on reflection and on students diagnosing their own knowledge. But unfortunately, if you want to read about it, you can read in that, in that, in that visitor guide. I, I don't have, 
unfortunately, time to um, work about it. And then the readiness assurance activity, which is taken from team-based learning. And if you're interested in team-based learning, I highly recommend going to a website called teambasedlearning.org. Um, and they have a couple of resources there which are really useful, including team-based exams, which, which this uh, essentially is where students actually you know, focus on formative assessment and on collaborative learning during the exam. I showed that briefly during my talk two and a half years ago. But unfortunately, I, I, I've gone to, so th this actually is a picture taken during a collaborative exam. I actually make a point of bringing in visitors during this part of the exam. And they don't know what's going on. And I mean, I, I use the word exam here. I never use the word exam in my group because it isn't really an exam. But I, I bring visitors in and let them observe, and then I say, what do you think the students are doing? Group work, problem solving. They're doing an exam. What? They're talking to each other? They're, they're actually smiling and having fun? It's not possible. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to skip that, though, because I, I don't have time. In fact, I'm going to skip the self-peer and team assessment, too, uh, because I, I don't have time. But you can sort of see the feedback that they give that they give to each other. So this is one student's feedback from his or her four teammates. Look, I would suggest being more responsive. Sometimes you're not engaged in the activities. It was hard to understand what you actually thought about an idea or project. You could be more reasonable about what's actually feasible and what isn't. And then the student has also a self-reflective part of it that we compare. So that you just, as a student, you get to see, this is what I thought about myself. This is what the others think about you in that respect. So let me briefly talk about assessment. So there are these four dimensions, self-directed learning, learning goals, teamwork, and professionalism. I evaluate the students in these four dimensions. Each of those is evaluated on a scale of zero to three. Two means you've met the requirements. One means you need improvement in this dimension. Zero means you're deficient in this dimension. Very few students get that. Three means you've gone the extra mile. I give that very rarely. You know, less than 5% of the students will get a three. Now, each of these has a number of inputs. For example, the self-directed learning, the annotations in perusal, and the at-home part of the problem sets factor into this. For professionalism, participation in class, punctuality, and ethics, uh, uh, filter in. And each of these is again evaluated on a scale of 0 to 3. So I continuously have an evaluation in these nine dimensions of every student. I keep track of that throughout the term. Now here's the, the, the trick. To get from here to there, we take the lowest score. So if this is a 2 and this is a 0, that becomes a 0. Right? You may think, oh, that's harsh. Well, the problem is if you tell the student what the expectations are, they're going to work very hard to meet those expectations. So you have to sort of raise the bar. This also means a student cannot be strategic. I think, I'm going to put all my effort here and not do that. Because it's the lowest of those that it's going to factor into. I would love to stop there in terms of my assessment. Unfortunately, the registrar at Harvard demands a grade. I hate grades. But I have to hand in a grade. So we have sort of a lookup table that converts these scores into a letter grade. I'm very unhappy about it. But I tell my students, if I'm going to write a letter for you, I'm going to ignore the grade and focus on, on this. Because this actually gives me the opportunity to tell, the, to, to tell an employer or, or wherever the student needs a letter for, you know, how they work together, how they learn. I can take some quotes from the peer evaluation about what other students think of that student. Okay, I'm going to end in the last five minutes by briefly telling you a little bit about the results. And we're going to again use these uh, four outcomes. Um, here is the pre and post test. We have two actually, one in the fall, one in the spring. I'm only showing one here, showing the gain in conceptual understanding in this course, AP 50. Uh, Compared to what I had in the course that completely focused on conceptual understanding using peer instruction, the one I taught before. Yeah? If I look at problem solving ability, these are scores on problems, um, and I compare that to physics 11, within the error bar, or the standard deviation, I should say, they're the same. So I have not sacrificed content mastery 
by changing. But I've added so much more, right? Uh, students are able to learn on their own. Uh, I've already shown this, this graph, right? I mean, I know that in my previous course, that was definitely not the case. Um, and, and, oh, here are some of the quotes, by the way. I think the perusal app annotation is way better than just reading a textbook normally. I've been reading for almost four hours now and haven't gotten bored. Of course, he was reading my book, so <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> and the homework. I have some students who bring in 25 pages. I have never seen this. Normally, they would just write the answer and expect to get grade. Here, they actually write out the steps, getting started, create a plan, execute the plan, evaluate the answer. It's just amazing what they do. I'd never seen that before. What about teamwork? Now, in the collaborative exams, they first answer questions individually, and then in the team round, they have to re-answer the same question as a team. So the team sees the question again, and then they have to answer it. If they get it right the first time, they get four points. If they don't get it right the first time, they have a second attempt, they can still get two points. If it's still wrong, they can get a third try for one point. I showed that method uh, a few years ago. And if they still get it wrong, the system reveals the correct solution. They get zero points, but they get, okay. Let me show you some absolutely stunning data. I'll go slowly because it requires some interpretation. So here on the horizontal, it shows the number of team members who got a correct individual round. So zero means the four or five of us were together, but each of us gave the wrong answer. Not necessarily the, the same answers, but a wrong answer. More likely different wrong answers. One means one of us has it correct. Two, me, two or more means two or more get it correct. This shows the percentage of team that are correct in the team round. After one round, if two or more students have the correct answer, 95% of the teams get the right answer. And that makes sense, right? I mean, we're a group of five, two have the right answer. They'll talk to one who have the wrong answer into the right answer, right? So, so that makes sense. And it's lower when there's only one, because he has to work against three or four people who have another answer, or she. But look at this. Nobody has the right answer. Daniel has the wrong answer. You got the wrong answer. You got the wrong answer. I got the wrong answer. You but somehow we're talking to each other. I point out the flaws in Daniel's thinking. Daniel points out the flaws in his thinking. And somehow, at some point, the group goes, oh, you know? T close to 30% gets the right answer on the first round. Do they get feedback from the system right at the end of it? No, right? instantaneously as they answer. So, they so if we... They were right. Whoever was right the first time knows who was right. No, 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 well, no. No, 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 no. In the individual round, they get no feedback. Uh -huh. Right? But in the team round, you get feedback. Right? So in the team round, once we settle on an answer, right, we have one person of the team who enters the answer, and the system immediately says that's right or that's wrong. Right? Okay. After the second attempt, this cannot go up very much. Right? This goes up significantly. This goes up even more significantly. And after three attempts, close to 60% have the right answer. That's just amazing. You have to work well together, right? Here was what some students wrote. We're all very committed to putting our own weight. So when somebody knew they hadn't done as much work on one part, they volunteered to take on more the next time. Wouldn't you want your colleagues to be like this? I do. <laughs> I think the fact that we all had experience working in a group like this was very helpful, especially since we had less time to form team identity given the shorter time frame on this project. We all recognize these sort of strengths and weaknesses without needing to spell them out. And I think we capitalize on those effectively throughout the project. Professionalism, you know, the attendance. In my peer instruction class, I got maybe 70, 80 percent. Here, it's in the high 90s. In fact, they come to class sick. I have to tell them, go home. You know, I don't feel that well, but I don't want to let my team down. I said, you're going to make your team sick. Go, go back home. Right? Um, Course evaluation, even though it's a required course, very, uh, uh, very high, it's not an elective. The structure of the classmate was my least favorite subject to one of my favorites. I was worried that people, including myself, would just slack off and do the bare minimum, but you really need to be on top of your readings and concepts in order to contribute to your class. Great class. Here's what another student wrote. Dear Harvard students, 
This class will be unlike any class you've taken at Harvard and it will hopefully shift the entire foundation upon which you base your education. I truly believe everyone should take this course. Now listen to this. Prepare to take full ownership of your learning. I got goosebumps when I read that. I had never mentioned the word ownership to my students. Never. But it was a design goal for my course. Here it came back to me in the evaluations. And you know, initially in the classroom, nobody wanted to teach. There was just one computer science faculty and me teaching in that weird classroom. Now it's gotten very popular, but initially it was just him and me. So we had the classroom to ourselves. Students would stay, and after three hours, they would not leave because they were so engaged in whatever they were doing. We had to tell them, you know, go home, we need to clean up. <laughs> now here's another thing, self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is your belief in being able to succeed in a given field. When I taught Physics 11b, I noticed, and I first started measuring self-efficacy, I noticed it went down. In other words, at the end of my physics course, students believed less in their ability to be successful in physics than at the beginning. I was crushed. I called up the person who had designed this at the University of Maryland, and I showed him these data, and he said, look, within standard deviation, it's the same, which is actually very good, because in a normal physics course, this tanks. So I learned to appreciate this as a good result. In AP50, it actually went up, and this is statistically significant. We have much more data now than I, I had here. Anyway, I want to end by saying I think you can create ownership of learning, even with something as generally hated as, <laughs> as physics, and, and, and make it fun. Look at the smiles on the faces of these students, right? They actually were, were smiling. In fact, the word fun came back over and over in my evaluations. Here's what one student wrote. You come out with so much knowledge and experience and fun. I had never seen the word fun in the evaluations of my course uh, before. And I think, you know, that's actually the way education should be. Thank you very much. Actually, what you showed about uh, taking the question on your own and then uh, then reacting with your teammates to improve it is something that uh, <coughs> is my witness and so is Abigail. I thought of it and I didn't know how to implement it. Is there a tool that is the... In, in which part of the course? Uh, any part, any weekly task. I, I want yeah, I, 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 unfortunately, I skipped over a lot of the details because really, to tell you, um, all the details would take three hours rather than one hour. Uh, were you there during the first part of the course when I talked about the platform yeah. proposal? So, so the proposal, of course, in a sense, sets the stage. That's the only tool we use, however. Um, in terms of the peer and self-assessment, we use it. We initially used a tool that we developed ourselves, but we didn't have enough time to really fully develop it, and it's very instructor unfriendly. And more recently, I was in sabbatical last year, so other colleagues of mine started teaching it, and I did not have the time to train them into the tool that we had developed. But it turns out that the engineering community has developed a tool. <laughs> If you go to the website CATME, C-A-T, I forgot what C-A-T stands for, dot M-E, me, uh, you'll find one self-peer and team evaluation that, that you can use. It's a, it's a ready tool. So it's a way of students giving feedback to each other. And there are two uh, implementation modes. One, you have to ask the people of CATME to unlock it for you where the student's feedback gets anonymized and released to the other students so they can actually see it. Uh, other than that, um, <clears throat> we, most of the activities in class, we have students give feedback to each other. Maybe I should briefly explain what we do with the homework. So homework in physics typically consists of a list of problems that you have to solve, and then you hand them in, and, and you get evaluated on the answers you give. We tell our students that the homework has two phases, an at-home phase and an in-class phase. The at-home phase is, the, is focused on the development of skills and is evaluated on effort. The in-class 
case, in part, is focused on reflection and diagnosing your own knowledge, and is evaluated on the accuracy of your self-evaluation. So, so essentially, we tell students, look, for each problem, we want to see four parts, a rephrasing of the problem, a development of an approach, a working out that approach, which is usually the maximum you see in a normal problem set, and then an evaluation of your result. Even if you get stuck in the execution, you still need to have that last part. Of course, there's no answer to evaluate, but you have to use some kind of estimation skill in order to predict what you would have gotten if you would have worked out the problem quantitatively using estimation skills. And we tell them that we're evaluating them on effort. But well, there's no way to cheat effort. You know, you, you just have to do it. That, that's, in a sense, why we get some students handed in 25%. Then they bring that to class, and we put on each table uh, red pens. And they're, the at-home part, they have to write in blue or in black. And they're not allowed to use red. And in class, they're only allowed to use red. So the red pens are on the table. And there's a reflection sheet on the table. My original plan was to put the solutions on the table and to have the students compare their solutions to the official solutions I wrote. My secretary, the first time, this was one of these serendipitous great things, my, my secretary forgot to copy the solutions. Students came in, they sat down, and she just walked in, and I said, Virginia, where are the solutions? I said, what solutions? And I said, well, what solutions? I, mean, I sent you the solutions two days ago. I was ready to kill her, you know, because I, already I was nervous about what I was doing because I'd never done it, and now the central part of the plan fell apart. So I thought, what am I going to do? There's no other activity to keep the students busy, you know, and, 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 and I, was, I, I was just sweating on my forehead. But I know the students just sat down, and they looked at the, the instruction sheet that told them to improve their solutions and to, to, to mark what they'd learned from doing the problem set and, you know, how they would evaluate their own knowledge and a strategy for improving their knowledge. And what happened was that students would just, it didn't, the instruction sheet did not refer to solutions. So what students did is, says, Dan, wh why do you have this factor two? And, and then Dan and the student would go to the board and start working on it. They, they, had, they saw no problem at all, you know. 45 minutes later, my, <coughs> my secretary came in with a stack of solutions, which we handed out, and it killed the discussion. <laughs> All of a sudden, the whole room turned silent, and every student was comparing the solution to his or her solution. And, but what was good, that by then they had thought about it so long that they found the mistakes in my solution. <laughs> <laughs> it was perfect. <laughs> So now we ask the student, do you want to see the official solutions? And we actually have teams often say, no, 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 we're not done yet. We first want to work on it our, by ourselves. Mm -hmm. right? But it takes away the pressure from the student to just get the right answer and creates the opportunity for them to reflect. So this, but notice that for everything, there's always first an individual responsibility and then a team. It's always a two-step process. Mm -hmm. As an individual, then as a team, for the problem set, for the examinations, for the project, everything has an individual component somehow so that, you know, you can't just get by by not doing anything. You have to contribute to your team. More details in that handout. And maybe when I come back to say more about this class. Yes. Learn how to do just like doing. Yeah, I, te I teach them team skills in a sense by doing these activities the way I described, and I, I realize that I, I've omitted many details, but I have to say I probably could improve significantly on um, on uh, on on have more you know, guidance in developing of the team skills. I think the most important part is to form effective ski teams by, and in fact, we work together with Google. Google is very engaged in trying to find ways of building effective teams. They have, of course, much more data than I have. And um, 
they found something really interesting, which we were just about stumbling on as well, namely that empathy in a team is really important. And, and it's really important to get to know the other team members on a personal level. So that's why, in a sense, the team contract, I tell my students, you know, exchange phone numbers. Tell, tell, <coughs> tell each other something about yourself that connects to the others. It turns out that that is actually a really important part of team building. And then, of course, developing a team identity. I think we're running out of time. So uh -huh. I, 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 I hope that, you know, first of all, write down that first. Uh, that that first URL, you can get a 50-page visitor packet. No, but the, the slides, I'll make sure that they're on this computer. <laughs> I'll make sure. We that have both presentations on our website. Yes. Okay. okay so Thank you. Thank you very, very much.